Good morning, everybody. I am Pierre Galland. I am the general coordinator of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, and I'm, I am very pleased to meet you this morning after the fourth session of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine here in New York. Just after this press conference, the jury will be received here just in front at the UN so that uh, we will have one hour press conference. And uh, may I start saying, may this tribunal prevent the crime of silence. That was why the sentence made by Russell at the first Russell tribunal on Vietnam in 1966. And uh, today, may this tribunal prevent the crime of silence on the question of the Palestinian right, the question of the international law, the question of the responsibility of the international community. I have here with me the conclusion of the two first sessions of the tribunal in Barcelona on the complicity of the European country, European institution, in London on the complicity of the corporates, and after that we went to Cape Town. In Cape Town, we have examined if the crime of apartheid is applicable to Israel, and the answer was yes. These two documents are the two first part of our work, and today you will receive in a few minutes or seconds, I don't know if somebody is ready to distribute it. That's the first draft of the summary of the conclusion that the jury have taken yesterday. To present this, executive summary, I ask Michael Mansfield to take the floor. But before that, let me tell you that I have here with me this little book. Do you know what that is? That's the human rights, universal human rights declaration, 30 article. And we have with us today the last survivor having take part to the construction of this 30 article, Stefan Essel. Stefan Essel is still here, and he is the chair of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine. And I am so happy that he is with us today. So Stefan, if you will say some words, you are welcome. Thank you. You must come here. For the uh, mic the mi uh, there is a little problem with the microphone. Obviously, come here, come here. for me, sorry, I go over there. The mountain won't come to Mohammed. <laughs> it is of such great importance for what we all are trying to achieve that the media should carry the message. It is in our world today only the media. When I arrived in the United Nations in February 1946, most of you were not even born. <laughs> I was impressed by the fact that for the first time in human history, we had an organization whose charter was speaking not about governments, but about the peoples, we the peoples. To whom do we owe that? To a great American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I must remember him, because without his pressure, neither Stalin nor Churchill would have accepted the United Nations. We have had it now for over 60 years, and it is essential that it should perform what it has been asked to perform and what it has been built for, particularly the absolute uh, uh, denial of any form of racism, even if it is expected, expressed in a way that seems just quiet and nice. But we don't want that, and we have to be sure that we will be able to transmit a message that will go beyond New York, beyond the United States, all over the world, because what happens uh, in Palestine and what is the measure of our 
complete discontent and incredible uh, shame must change, things make it possible that it should change, and I want all of you to be partners in an effort that we, the jury, have been carrying during the third and the fourth session, and that message must now go through. Thank you for being here. All my congratulations to all the members of our jury and to the press and the media. Be brave. Uh, good morning and welcome. Can I just say, first of all, that after I've read, and I will read it as I have on previous occasions, uh, the re that it's a draft, as has already been said. You may imagine that last night was a very short time in which the jury had in order to deliberate, come to conclusions, then draft them, then draft them again. And you will appreciate, therefore, there may be typos, there may be errors, We've tried to correct it as far as possible, and then clearly, in about 28 days' time, a, a month or so, the full version will be published, an amplified version. So this is really an, a, an executive summary. Now, can I also check that you all have this uh, executive summary, because otherwise me, I, I don't like reading documents, but I think it's essential here that it is read. Um, and that you can follow it if you wish to. Now, before I do uh, embark upon it, can I also say, once I've finished doing it, uh, there will be time for questions from the floor to the jury panel. And we're in a position, obviously, to answer them as far as we can. And we're very happy to do so. so and when you ask questions, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to indicate who you are the organization you represent or the form of media that you represent uh, so that that can be noted because as you will see it's all being recorded. Now also before I read the first introductory paragraph of the document you all have, I'm just pausing to make sure it's been passed around. It's not. It's not. Is there anybody? Who, yes, any you will receive it. It's, um, it's there's it's somebody it's here who hasn't got it. I think it's important that everybody does. Another person there. Uh, I don't know where the copies are. If, if they could just... We're we, we making extra copies now. Um, uh, all right. Well, it, it might be useful if I just um, occupy a few moments of your time before I read it out. They've got it now. Okay. The initial observations I want to make, and I make it on behalf of the tribunal, is that we all have come together as a jury, together with the witnesses who gave evidence over the two days for which we are grateful, with a unity of purpose. The purpose is going to be made clear in the report, but in any event, you no doubt were aware of the foundations of the Russell Tribunal uh, before we started this particular session, the fourth session. Because, as Pierre has already indicated, there are two previous reports which make very, very clear the direction in which we've been going. Uh, and I think it's important that there should not be <coughs> any misunderstandings about how we function, why we function, or what the objectives are. And I think it's clear that at the end of the day, everybody was traveling in the same direction. There are occasional deviations, but they must not, those deviations, be misunderstood. That's the first point. The second point I'd like to make is to re-emphasize the fact that the tribunal sees this moment in history as apocryphal. 
because we are not conducting these hearings in isolation. We're not conducting these hearings, as it were, divorced from world events. And it's perfectly clear you will all be aware of what the world events are. There are world events that embrace peoples not just in Palestine or Israel or all the continents of the world. These are moments in which you will all be aware that citizens, and we are a citizens' tribunal, citizens are rising up and taking control. They're doing it in different ways, in different places. Some of them in response to outrageous economic conditions. Some of them in response to outrageous political conditions. But they all have one objective. The same objective that we have. The objective is to remove a yoke, a yoke of repression, a yoke of oppression with which they've been saddled by political classes who are far removed and out of touch with other vested interests in mind. And the tribunal wanted to capture the spirit and the conscience of these peoples. Because what's happening in Palestine is an echo of what is happening elsewhere. And what happens in Palestine matters to all of us. The basic freedoms are indivisible. Wherever they exist, they're indivisible. And that's why what happens there, what happens in the rainforests of South America, what happens in tar sands in Alberta, what happens in Rwanda, matters to all of us because there is one underlying principle. Martin Luther King said there can be no peace without justice. A well hallowed phrase. But you have to extend it a little bit further. There can be no justice without truth. And that is it, the attempt that the tribunal has made, is to resurrect this and put it center stage and supplant <laughs> vested interest, which is usually self-interest. And in place, put the interests of others, put the interests of humanity. That's the preamble I'd ask you to consider, and it comes from the heart of all of us. Now, I'm going to, to read uh, the report, draft report. So I'm hoping by now you, do, you all do have uh, copies of this. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just going to move this so it doesn't cast a shadow too much. Is that still working? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll read what I'm going to do so you know it. I'm going to omit technical references. In other words, citations and so on. I, I'm sure you don't, they're all written out there, so you don't need to have them read out as well. So this is the executive summary of the findings of the fourth session of the Russell Tribunal. Uh, and bear in mind, I'm going slowly because some are being translated. The fourth session of the Russell Tribunal continued its historic function of articulating civic protest and carrying the weight of insufferable conditions at a moment when the world society is facing its most incredible challenges. It should be noted that the UN Charter was created to emphasize the rights of people and not states. 
The final session of the tribunal focused on the responsibility of the United States of America and the United Nations regarding the Israeli breaches of international law towards Palestine. There is now a situation in which Israel has achieved a status of immunity and impunity by their complete disregard for the norms and standards of international law facilitated by the United States of America. After hearing various witnesses and experts, the tribunal has reached the following conclusions. It, it should be noted that invitations were extended to the United States and Israel, both of whom failed to respond. And may I just add, we, we sent a letter of, of protest, effectively, about this failure to even extend the basic courtesy. Uh, and those copies of that letter are available. Paragraph one, Israelis' violations of international law. Three, as recalled by the tribunal, during its previous sessions, various well-documented acts committed by Israel constitute violations of several basic rules of international law to be found in international customary law, treaties, resolutions of the political organs of the United Nations, and the advisory opinion on the legal consequences of the construction of a wall in the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, this is the International Court of Justice decision known commonly as the wall decision. Now there are thereafter in this six violations specified as bullet points. The first is this, the violations namely. The violation of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. The violation of customary law, human rights, norms and customary international humanitarian law by prohibiting the return of Palestinian refugees to their homes. The violation of the Security Council resolutions requiring Israel to withdraw from the occupied territory and the UN Charter which obliges the member states to carry out the decisions of the Security Council violation of the principle of the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war and the Security Council resolutions condemning the annexation of Jerusalem. The tribunal notes that this includes the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, as well as the Gaza Strip, since Israel's withdrawal from the Gaza Strip has not ended the occupation of this territory. This appears from the fact that Israel still maintains control of all air and maritime spaces of the Gaza Strip, as well as control along the land border and inside the Gaza Strip, a 300 meter wide buffer zone, 600 and 1,500 meters wide in some places, which is a no-go zone, depriving Gaza of 35% of its cultivatable land and areas. Violation of the Palestinian people's right to their natural resources and wealth through the Israeli use of Palestinian agricultural land, <coughs> the exploitation of pla Palestinian water resources and reserves, and preventing Palestinian access to more than 10% of their safe drinking water reserves. Violation of international humanitarian law prohibiting the establishment of Israeli settlements, the expulsions of Palestinians from their territory, the demolitions and expropriations of Arab houses and lands situated in the occupied country, mistreatment, torture, and prolonged administrative detention of Palestinians in Israeli prisons. Non-compliance with the right of return of Palestinian refugees to their homes. Military attacks against civilians. Indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks 
against Gaza and Palestinian refugee camps. The terms are articulated by the 2004 decision in the wall. Further, violation of fundamental rights and freedoms such as freedom of movement, freedom of religion, right to work, to health, to education because of the Israeli wall and the checkpoints in the occupied territory which prevent Palestinian free access to their workplace, school, health services and religious places. Violation of the prohibition of dis discrimination based on national origin through Israeli policies and practices is akin to apartheid. Cape Town findings of this tribunal which have denied Palestinians of a functioning nationality. Among these violations of international law, several of them are criminally sanctioned. War crimes, Israeli settlements, inhumane treatment, torture, indiscriminate attacks, home demolitions, forced population transfer, collective punishment. Crimes against humanity, persecution as defined by the International Criminal Court, crime of apartheid, and of course we include in that the Cape Town findings are of this tribunal alongside all the other matters that are mentioned there. Because of their systematic, numerous, flagrant, and sometimes criminal character, these violations are of a particularly high gravity. Now I come to the United States' complicity in Israel's violations of international law. Paragraph 5 is where I'm on. The tribunal finds that Israel's ongoing colonial settlement expansion, its racial separatist policies, as well as its violent militarism, would not be possible without the United States' economic, military, and diplomatic support. Following World War II and since then, the United States has demonstrated a commitment to Israel's establishment and viability as an exclusionary Jewish state at the expense of Palestinian human rights. While the United States administrations initially offered moral support since the Six-Day War in 1967, the United States has provided unequivocal economic, military, and diplomatic support to Israel in order to establish a qualitative military superiority over its Arab neighbors in violation of its own domestic law. Economic aid. The United States unconditional support for an internationally recognized <coughs> occupying power has made Israel the largest recipient of United States foreign aid since 1976 and the largest cumulative recipient since World War II in the amount of approximately $115 billion. <laughs> Significantly, the United States provides its economic aid to Israel as a lump sum and in the form of forgivable loans, thereby making it exceptional among all of its foreign beneficiary counterparts. Diplomatic aid. Between 1972 and 2012, the United States has been the lone veto of UN resolutions critical of Israel 43 times. Of those, 30 concerned the occupied territory. Israel's consistent violations of the Geneva Conventions is largely attributable to external protection that its special relationship with the United States affords. <laughs> military aid. Israel receives 60% of the United States foreign military financing, FMF, 
funding, making it the largest recipient of United States military funding. It now ranks as one of the top ten arms suppliers globally. Israel also receives funds from annual defense appropriation bills for joint U.S.-Israeli missile defense programs that can exceed $100 million. None of these are subject to rigorous United States law including the Arms Export Control Act, the Foreign Assistance Act, the Mutual Bilateral <coughs> Agreement between Israel and the United States. It's therefore the opinion of this tribunal that the United States has committed the following violations of international and United States law. By enabling and financing Israel's violations of international humanitarian and human rights norms, the the United States is guilty of complicity in international wrongful acts. Once again, I'm omitting the citations. By obstructing accountability for violations of the Geneva Conventions, the United States has failed to meet its obligations as a high contracting par party. In continuing to provide economic support for settlement expansion, the United States is also in violation of the International Court of Justice's jurisprudence. By stonewalling an international resolution to the conflict, by abusing its veto power within the Security Council, the United States is in violation of several provisions of the United Nations Charter, particularly Article 24. By failing to condition military aid to Israel based on its compliance with human rights norms and strict adherence to the law of self-defense, the United States is in violation of its own domestic law. Part three. The United Nations responsibility for the failure to prevent Israel's violations of international law. The tribunal faced the following questions. <coughs> Do the Israeli violations of international law oblige the United Nations to act or prevent or stop such violations? Secondly, if so, how should the United Nations react? And thirdly, if the United Nations did not react properly, what are the consequences of this omission? Taking the first one. The United Nations obligations with regard to violations of international law committed by Israel. As affirmed by the International Court of Justice, the case is mentioned, the United Nations is a subject of international law, which, like states, is bound by international law, and especially the United Nations Charter and the general international law. The Charter stipulates that the United Nations purpose <coughs> is to maintain international peace and security, respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples, to promote respect for human rights for all. The Charter provides that the United Nations must take effective collective measures to achieve these goals. Failure to do so amounts to a failure to meet its mandate. The same idea flows from the rules relating to the right of peoples to self-determination, human rights, and the obligation to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. In the decision on the wall, the International, Criminal, uh, International Court of Justice said, the United Nations, and especially the General Assembly and the Security Council, should consider what further action is required to bring to an end the illegal situation resulting from the construction of the wall and, and the associated regime. Secondly, how must the United Nations fulfill its obligation to ensure respect for the law of the Charter and the basic norms of general international law. 
As a subject of international law, the United Nations is, like a state, bound to fulfill its international obligations in good faith. Significantly, in a recent declaration of the high-level meeting of the General Assembly on the rule of law at the national and international levels, the United Nations General Assembly declared that the rule of law applies to all states equally and to international organizations, including the United Nations and its principal organs, and that respect for and promotion of the rule of law and justice should guide all of their activities. You will see that that's a very recent declaration, 19th of September, 2012. This means that the United Nations must do everything reasonably within its power to ensure that the rule of law is properly applied. This leads to the conclusion that the United Nations cannot simply denounce and condemn Israel's violations of international law, since these oft-repeated condemnations have not resulted in the cessation of Israel's internationally wrongful acts. It follows that the United Nations must do more. Security Council is fully aware of this when it repeatedly said that it would resort to other measures if Israel didn't comply with its decisions. Yet, it does little more than to continue to deplore and condemn. The United Nations General Assembly has hardly been better in spite of its right to seize a case on the agenda of the United Nations Security Council. The United Nations organs have a duty to ensure respect of international law in terms of the United Nations Charter, as well as the due diligence rule the responsibility to, and the responsibility to protect and the obligation to struggle against impunity. This duty also reflects well-established practice of the United Nations Security Council itself in many other cases for over 40 years, and the other cases are then cited in parentheses. The Security Council has handed over responsibility for peace making in the Middle East to the Quartet, comprising the United Nations, the <coughs> European Union, the United States, and the Russian Fer Federation. The Quartet and its envoy have failed to effectively oppose settlement building, the construction of the wall, and violations of both international humanitarian law and human rights law by Israel. It's clear that the United States determines the response of the Quartet to these matters. And this raises serious questions about the good faith of the Quartet. Consequently, the Quartet has made little attempt to prevent violations of international law. As a member of the Quartet, the United Nations bears responsibility for its failures. The International Court of Justice decision on the wall declares that the law on a number of violations of international law by Israel, the United Nations has failed to use its best endeavors to implement this advisory opinion, which I may add it asked for in the first place. In conclusion, the United Nations' failure to take action proportionate to the duration and severity of our Israel's violations of international law, war crimes, crimes against humanity, the crime of apartheid, genocide, and by not exhausting all peaceful means of pressure available to it, the United Nations does not comply with the obligations that states have conferred on the United Nations. The above examples confirm that by its failure to act more strongly than it does, the United Nations violates international law. The effect of these failures is to undermine the rule of law and the integrity and legitimacy of the institutions of international law. Thirdly, legal consequences of the United Nations omissions. The lack of concrete United Nations actions against Israel constitutes an internationally wrongful act which prejudices Palestine 
and implicates the organization's responsibility. The unlawful nature of the United Nations omissions is acute due to their exceptional gravity under international law. These necessitate appropriate responses from the organization which has particular responsibilities for maintaining international peace and security. As stated classically in the International Law Commission's draft articles on responsibility of international organizations, the United Nations must stop its wrongful omission and compensate for the damage suffered by Palestine. Fourthly, the question of sociocide. Sociocide was first introduced at the 2011 Cape Town session to reflect a sentiment that Palestinian people are enduring the systematic destruction of their language, culture, and more generally their society. It was integrated into this session for further investigation. As to sociocide, the tribunal notes that it is currently not a crime under international law, even though the concept is used by academics in order to describe the process of destroying a society's ability to endure over time through, one, the widespread or systematic destruction of its social and political structures. Secondly, the widespread or systematic destruction of its, na of its material and immaterial <coughs> elements of shared identity. The tribunal considers that the, those widespread and systematic destructive processes are currently going on in Palestine. The continuing military occupation of the territory, the continuing building of settlements, the construction of the wall that places parts of the Palestinian territory out of reach of Palestinians, the blockade of the Gaza Strip, materially impede Palestinians from organizing a political structure that would fully be able to administer the Palestinian territory or people over time. The widespread destruction of education facilities, places of worship, as well as the general situation in the occupied territory makes it impossible for the Palestinians to properly share elements of cultural and social identity. The tribunal considers that Israel is currently committing sociocide in Palestine but strongly emphasizes that all those acts are already condemned by current positive international law as being either crimes against humanity, which includes the Convention on the Suppression of Apartheid, or war crimes susceptible of being prosecuted by the International Criminal Court in the terms <coughs> of the Rome Statute 1998. Conclusions, ways forward, and continuation of the proceedings. At this time of international political and economic turbulence, it is particularly important for there to be a credible and effective system of international justice. The system presently has shown itself quite unable to bring about change. This can, however, be achieved by Firstly, the mobilization of international public opinion, especially in the United States and Israel, towards a just society based on equality before the law via the various manifestations of civic society. And then we give the examples, networks, movements with particular emphasis upon the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, otherwise known as BDS, trade unions, and other campaigns and secondly, by social media networks. Secondly, paying attention to the vital role of criminal and civil litigation against the perpetrators of the various violations before domestic courts. The referral of crimes committed in Palestine to the International Criminal Court by the Security Council or by the acceptance of the declaration made by the Palestinian government in January 2009, accepting the competence of the International Criminal Court. Fourthly, reforming the United Nations itself, for example, by the abolition of the veto by the five permanent members of the Security <laughs> Council, 
the expansion of the membership of the Security Council in the hope of democratization and a revival of the existing powers of the General Assembly as well as a consideration of further powers. Lastly, the Russell Tribunal declares its commitment to continue its work on Palestine by monitoring progress and disseminating information. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. They can't clap today. No. No, can't do that. So, thank you. And now uh, I will ask the journalist, a member of the press, uh, if they will present a question to say uh, their name and they are from where they are coming uh, with journal, with news, and uh, to which they are reaching their question. Yes. There is. Hello, my name is Anna Francis. I'm from Columbia University Journalism. My question is, would the Russell Tribunal classify Palestinian leadership and the failure of Palestinian leadership as an internal struggle? Or is it directly um, affected by the occupation? And what is the Russell Tribunal's, uh, I guess, commitment? Or what is their prognosis of Palestinian leadership currently? John? Is the question addressed to one member in particular? Or? Um, no, just to the tribunal in, in, in general, actually. John? Um, Mary? It raises the question in authority. Yeah. The, the difficulty is that the president that the Russian tribunal Could you repeat your question? Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. No, right. So, John, you need to go. No, it's okay. It's working. No, no, but you need to go to the podium. All the mics are. Cannot pass it. Oh, yeah. You want to come here? We can put it forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, could, could you repeat your question again carefully? Could you repeat your question? Yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Yes. Okay. My question is again. Let me say my name. Anna Francis from yes. Columbia University Journalism. My question is, uh, in terms of the opinion of the Russell Tribunal, when it comes to Palestinian leadership, would the Russell Tribunal say it is an internal struggle, conflict, in the sense that of the failure of leadership? Is it directly affected by the occupation, or is it something more? Well, you, you ask a big question about the Palestinian leadership, which is not a subject that uh, we considered at the session, nor have we considered it at uh, previous sessions. Uh, speaking for myself, I, I think that uh, I would just like to say in, in my personal capacity that the Palestinian Authority uh, has in many respects failed to advance the cause of the Palestinian people, uh, but it is subject of course to extremely uh, difficult restraints. I think there is a uh, the policy of the Palestinian Authority at present is to defer action, particularly in respect of the vital question of statehood, until after the United States elections, which is understandable. The whole question of uh, Palestinian statehood will become an issue after the uh, US elections. Uh, either the General Assembly will uh, consider the matter, or there is a real possibility that the International Criminal Court will consider the matter, because in 2009, the Palestinian uh, Authority did make a declaration accepting the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court 
uh, in respect of all crimes committed in Palestine uh, after 2002, particularly crimes committed in the course of Operation uh, Cast Lead. So if the Assembly of State Parties or the General Assembly determines that Palestine is a state uh, for the purposes of the International Criminal Court, that will enable the uh, investigations into these crimes to go ahead. So that, that is an initiative taken by the Palestinian Authority in 2009. Uh, of course, there are other difficulties relating to the Palestinian Authority. We are all aware of the ongoing uh, conflict between Hamas and Fatah, which clearly has to be resolved. And I think we would all agree that that is of uh, primary importance. And, of course, there's also the difficulty that uh, elections have not been held in the uh, Palestinian territory uh, for many years. Uh, so I, I conclude by saying the Russell Tribunal has not made a decision on this matter. We have not considered it. Uh, in my personal capacity, I just feel that the Palestinian Authority uh, could do better. Can I, can I make a quick comment? Can you... Could you, the question be about the tribunal more than, than you know, Palestinian uh, politics? We've got 30 minutes sharp of actually 27, so thank you. I'm Cynthia McKinney, and I have um, something to say to the young woman from Colombia. I would ask you, which Palestinian leadership are you talking about? The leadership that is selected by the Palestinian people or the leadership of the Palestinian people that is selected by non-Palestinians. And so, of course, if you're talking about leadership that is not selected by the people themselves, it's going to be ineffective. It's going to do what other folk want it to do. It will not be representative of the values and the aspirations of the Palestinian people. But if you're talking about the leadership of the Palestinian people, the leadership as recognized by the Palestinian people, well, first of all, you can't talk about that without talking about targeted assassination. They don't live any longer. They live in fear. They're underground. They're in prison if they happen to be elected. Thank you. I, I, I think that uh, my name is Maria McGuire. Um, the, the myth. Sorry? Sorry, the mic. Jerry, we not spend too much time on this question. Uh, all right. The myth that pa Israel has never had a partner for peace is something that we have to correct. Israel has always had, with the Palestinians, partners for peace. When I visited Yasser Arafat in Ramallah in his compound, he was asking for dialogue. He was loved by the Palestinian people. Instead of dialogue, he was getting bombed. When I visited with the Free Gaza on the boat into Gaza, and met with Hamas and spoke at the Hamas parliament. And the next day, I met with all the political groups in Hamas, in, in Gaza, together with Dr. Barghouti from Ramallah, who hadn't been able to make contact with his colleagues in Gaza for over two years, and had to go to Cyprus and go on a boat in a very dangerous journey to speak with Hamas and uh, Fatah in Gaza. We met in a hall where all the political groupings in Gaza were go talking for peace. People want peace. People are crying out for peace. And the next day, Hamas released the political prisoners. We sailed away believing this is possible. Hamas and Fatah and, and the West Bank and Gaza Peace is possible. People want peace. There are plenty of people there who can speak for the Palestinian people. And the next week, Israel bombed Gaza and destroyed it. War crimes, crimes against humanity. 
Israel doesn't want to talk peace. It's political leaders, Netanyahu, they want war. They don't want peace. They want settlements. They don't want peace. How can you make peace with the Israeli leadership like Netanyahu, who has a military mindset and isn't capable of thinking in a creative and visionary way and making peace with the Palestinians? In Northern Ireland, Senator Canada, 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 Clinton, Hillary, and her husband came to Northern Ireland and told us to speak to our enemies and make peace. And we did it, we did it with Americans' help. Today, Israel and Palestine need America's help based on international law and human rights to make peace. And it can be done. They helped us, they can do it in the Middle East. To be a real friend to Israel, which I hope I am, which I hope we all are, to be a real friend to the Palestinians, is the base international law and human rights at the top of the agenda. Do not make legal what is illegal. We've got many, many questions. So uh, I have my Ah bon, c'est pas moi qui décide. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Can you hear all right? Yes. No? Yes. Sorry. Fine. Um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to, to deal with this because I think it needs clarification. Uh, and Ronnie yesterday made the point, uh, which I endorse entirely, is that when we sat in South Africa and in Cape Town, we were <coughs> informed about the practices of the apartheid government. So it, it did inform us. But we were anxious to ensure that the, the model, if it can be called that, the practice of South Africa is not an exclusive, one only definition of apartheid. I appreciate apartheid connotes for different people different things, and it may have different reasons. Uh, and it may I explain the question that I was trying to ask yesterday, and if it was misunderstood, I, I do apologize for that. But the, the reason we're very, very anxious about this particular area, and the reason is that the inter we've, we've put it in the document that international law, in our view, already covers not just under the term apartheid, that, that is one term, Apartheid is defined in the Convention and defined in the Rome Statute. But the Rome Statute goes further. That's the Rome Statute that creates international crimes, effectively, which can be tried at the International Criminal Court. And what the International Criminal Court has done, or rather the statute has, the Rome Statute, is to increase a whole range of activities well beyond apartheid. So I think our point was, is that international law as it stands embraces all of the elements of sociocide. Nobody's denying what was said under the umbrella of the sociocide, namely all these particular actions. We appreciate all of them as expressed in that term. And all we're trying to say is our function is to attempt to put it on the agenda so that action can be taken. And I said yesterday, Another of our anxieties is the urgency of this situation. So I, I hope that satisfies what you're asking. That's how I'd respond. Where is the micro? Thank you. Is it self speak? Yeah. Thanks for the question, Sherman. Um, Michael Mansfield dealt with the question 
on, on the statute books and so on, Convention of Apartheid, etc. I think we've made that very clear yesterday. So let me just shift an answer to you in terms of the measures taken at the UN and by civil society during the apartheid era. You are asking where are the analogies? And rising out of the racist doctrine of both states, we've seen a similar move vis-a-vis -vis boycott, divestment, sanctions. So that's extremely applicable. And because we've been dealing here with the United Nations as well as civil society, I'd like to remind you of the resolutions which I think have been largely forgotten, the General Assembly resolutions of 1982 and 83 on Israel, at that time by the General Assembly regarded as this new aggressor after Le Lebanon and the invasion. And that General Assembly borrowed from the strategy of the ANC and the anti-apartheid movement and endorsed the idea, the first time against Israel, of arms, sanctions and general boycott. Now, I would say one could demonstrate over and over again why Zionist Israel and the lobby supporting it everywhere is in such a state of jitters because of the apartheid analogy. And it's because Israel that portends to be the light radiating unto the nations for human rights, etc., is so downright embarrassed that there should be the analogy that they run damn scared. And that's why the lobby takes it up, that same issue in USA, in South Africa and everywhere else. I think it shows very much that we're on the right track and BDS is the way. Now, that, that borrows from the apartheid struggle, doesn't it? Thank you. suggestions or recommendations is reform of the UN, which as we all know is not a speedy prospect, perhaps may not happen in any of our lifetimes. The second one, or one of them, is referral of crimes to the ICC. So since you've made that one of your recommendations, I'd like to know what your view is on the Palestinian strategy already mentioned here about trying to pursue non-member status, statehood in the General Assembly. Is that an effective route, do you think? To, to this uh, strategy of referring crimes to the ICC. Thank you. Joan? Uh, let me just deal with the whole question of referral of crimes to the uh, International Criminal Court. In the first instance, in the first instance, we stress that the Security Council does have the competence to refer the situation in Palestine uh, to the International Criminal Court in the same way that it uh, referred the question of uh, Darfur and Libya to the International Criminal Court. But that is unlikely because of the uh, possibility, probability, of a veto by the United States. The other avenues open to uh, the Palestinians in respect of the International Criminal Court are twofold. First of all, if the General Assembly does determine that uh, Palestine is a state, although not a member state of the United Nations, that would open the door for a uh, finding by the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court that Palestine is a state for the purposes of the Rome Statute and would allow it to proceed with an investigation. That is one possibility. The other possibility is the one that I referred to, which is not well known at present, and that is that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in April of this year declared that he was not competent to make the determination that Palestine was a state 
for the purposes of investigating international crimes, but that this could be done either by the General Assembly or by the Assembly of State Parties. The Assembly of State Parties, which is the body that governs the International Criminal Court, will meet in November of this year. And a, a proposal request has been made to the Bureau of the uh, International Criminal Court that it place the question of Palestinian statehood on the agenda of the uh, Assembly of State Parties. And if the Assembly of State Parties does decide that Palestine is a state uh, for the purpose of crimes uh, <coughs> within the meaning of the International Criminal Court statute, then the Assembly of State Parties will direct the prosecutor to proceed with an investigation. So I think it is clear that there are two possibilities of seizing the jurisdiction of the International <coughs> Criminal Court in respect of crimes committed in Palestine, particularly in the course of Operation Cast Lead. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I haven't um, been able to specifically follow the reaction to the Russell Tribunal, but uh, I can assume that it will be consistent uh, uh, with their, their past actions. Uh, but let me say that I think that uh, it is um, extremely important uh, that we examine uh, very specifically the complicity of uh, the United States government uh, uh, with respect to uh, the repression of uh, uh, associated with the occupation of, of Palestine. And I'll take this opportunity to say also uh, in response to the question about the analogy with uh, apartheid, you've already heard uh, a very articulate answers about the legal basis uh, for the decision to utilize this analogy, uh, we can also draw lessons uh, with respect to our um, attempt to shed light on uh, the United States complicity, the government as well as, as corporations, uh, for uh, the work that needs to be done on the ground in terms of activism and advocacy uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, we are confronting a situation uh, that has uh, made it very difficult precisely because of the Zionist lobby in this country to um, disseminate information about what is actually happening in, in, in Palestine. And my own experience has been that in speaking, you know, for example, to audiences of, of people who uh, have been historically in solidarity with the civil rights movement and the movement against segregation in the South, uh, that they're absolutely shocked to learn about the degree to which uh, the conditions in op occupied Palestine not only replicate the conditions of, of Jim Crow, but that it are in fact far worse. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the um, Russell Tribunal session here in New York will give us the opportunity to further um, uh, persuade people who believe in justice and equality and peace in, 
in this country uh, that they should join uh, the campaign uh, for solidarity with Palestinian people and Palestinian freedom. Yeah. We've got 10 minutes, so please, we'll yeah. take media questions first. So. Yes. Short question, please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Peter Bertolti <coughs> from the Danish newspaper, The Worker, and I actually have five questions. No, 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 no. <laughs> one, one, please. We cannot, we must leave. The UN, could you tell us exactly who? Um, to the book you mentioned in the beginning, talking about the London and South Africa, I'm wondering why not about Brussels? Because in Brussels we have the EU, and exactly now, the EU is upgrading its trade list relations with uh, Israel, the so-called ACAA uh, document. Yeah. Can you come to your question, Brita, please? That was the second one. <laughs> no. The, the questions in Israel, who are you meeting at the UN? Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I will answer to you first, um, but we cannot take five questions. The other On? sessions, there were a set yeah. of questions beforehand to all the other uh, sessions you had. Uh, this time, not. In the conclusions, uh, we see a few questions to the UN, but none to the US. Why? Um, Rita, they're not going to answer five questions, so, so we're going to have to pass the mic. Yeah. It's like, I, I can answer to first, the first question. We will go to the UN. We are invited by the Special Committee for the uh, Rights of the Palestinian People. And they will make for us a meeting inside the UN with the people of the UN. So they, they make the, the facilities for us. And uh, we thank the committee for the, this reason. About Brussels, but don't forget that in, we start in Barcelona. Barcelona was a session, especially session on Europe and on the European country. And uh, I can announce you that after the fourth session, the tribunal will come together again for a last session in Brussels, making the global conclusion for on, coming from the four different sessions. And uh, that would be um, somewhere in March. 2013. Okay. A last question, and after that, I am sorry because we must go to the to the UN. It was something like that. Uh, I, I will make a, a, an absolutely discrimination, and I take a last woman. <laughs> Yeah. Good question. But I can, I can give a part of the answer and maybe somebody in the, in the audience will, uh, maybe Roger. Uh, I, I will tell you, from the experience that we have from the former session, what we observe is that, and in the parliament, the European parliament, and in the Council of Human Rights in Geneva, and in some government, they have taken consideration the conclusion of the Russell Tribunal session from Barcelona and from Cape Town. That's first. And the second aspect is that what we observe, and we are invited to, to, to make conference, what we observe is that a lot of people in the civil society, in the trade unions, in the NGO, they have taken the conclusion of the Russell Tribunal as a means to have some legitimacy in their own activities. That's the two main aspects that I can share. But Roger, you can maybe edit something. Yeah, I have very little to say, but I'd like to say this. Uh, speaking as a new boy, this is the first time I've been on one of these tribunals. And uh, I've listened very carefully to two days of uh, extremely eloquent and uh, interesting testimony from various expert witnesses. And in response to the question that we had earlier, uh, which I believe was about um, us trying to guess um, what kind of an attacks we were going to come under from ADL and, and other um, 
uh, organizations that are likely to uh, attack our findings and, and recommendations. I would say this, because of the nature of the minds that are involved in this very, very careful and studied investigation into this problem in Palestine, we have arrived at findings after deliberations that seem to us to represent the truth of the matter. The truth is on our side. Now, in the final conclusion at the end of this thing, um, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, drafted that this can, however, be achieved by the mobilization of international public opinion. And I think that answers that question. What we need to do using social media, or, or you, all of you, anyone, um, every means at our disposal is to spread these findings because they very, very clearly state the truth of what is going on in the occupied territories in Israel and in Palestine and the complicity of the United States of America and the United Nations. Um, this is something that I had not understood before I became a juror uh, um, on this jury. Uh, I'm very proud to have been allowed to take part um, in these proceedings, and I think they uh, illuminate it. So th that's the main thing, using everything we can. We need this thing to go viral, and it will, I believe, through social networking and other things that all the young people can help us with. All right, so that, that's really all I have to say. Um, um, I'm so proud of these guys. And thank you. Let me, as the very old and the very UN-minded person, just give a few ideas. The United Nations is not a thing where there is somebody who has the power over what is going on. It is an organization composed of states, of nations. And contrary to what it says in the charter, we the peoples, the peoples have no other access to the UN than Article 71, which speaks about non-governmental organizations. The charter makes the states, member states, fully responsible for the way to work and it is only a majority in the General Assembly that can bring some new light. Unfortunately, as you know, the Security Council, when it holds a question, does not normally allow the General Assembly to act, but it can do so, it has done so, which we say in our conclusions, there are ways to get the Security Council to lead to the General Assembly. Today, the majority of the General Assembly of the United Nations can do the same that what the majority of member states of UNESCO has done recently by giving the status of a state to Palestine. That is an enormous progress. Tomorrow, if the General Assembly is determined to give the status of state to the Palestinian people. It can do so, and it can prevent the Security Council from going against it by voting such a thing as United Nations for Peace, which is done in other occasions. In other words, if we have, through the media represented here, a sufficiently strong appeal to citizens all over the world, and particularly to citizens in this marvelous country of the United States, which has had a record of bringing forward the most important <laughs> progress in international behavior. Then we have the needs, we have the means of going further, getting a statehood to the Palestinian people and thereby allowing it to play the role that it can and must play towards its neighbor, the neighbor with which it wants to have 
concrete and positive relations and not to be subservient to a government in Israel, which at present, as you all know, is the most right-wing and the most anti-democratic government that Israel has ever had. The way is there, it is open. Let us use what we can in the United Nations. The Council for Human Rights, OCHA, UNRWA, and all the other instruments, and let them go together in the final effort to give us what we need, which is a Palestine able to lead its own way into its own future. So thank you very much for coming and uh, see you in Brussels. <laughs>